Hey, and welcome back to the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. I am Joe Sebelia. Please subscribe to this channel here on YouTube or wherever you are listening to this podcast. My next guest, my next guest is JJ French from the band Twisted Sister. JJ is the founding member of the band, also the guitar player of the band. And he has a new book out called Twisted Business, Lessons from My Life in Rock and Roll. Very good book. I definitely recommend you pick it up. You can find it on Amazon. And also, uh, I'll provide a link here in the show notes. Uh, if you want to link directly to it and pick it up, I definitely recommend it. I'm going to talk to JJ about that. Also going to talk to JJ about his battle with prostate cancer and the importance of getting yourself checked for prostate cancer if you fall into the probably the 40 to 50 year range. That's probably when you should start getting checked out. Um, we're going to talk to him about that. We're going to talk to him about uh, lots of other things, including some rare stories that he has says he has not told many people. So stick around. I hope you enjoy this conversation with JJ French. It's the rock and roll and rock and show. Yeah, we do. All right, JJ. Now I got to ask you this though. Do you remember the Morton Downey Jr. show being on there? Yeah, yeah, I remember it really well. <laughs> that you were uh, going off on. I don't remember that lady's name with the PMRC, but you were going off on her. And then Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Norwood, I think was her name. I think you're right. I think you're right. Jen Norwood, and uh, and the, the story that le the led up to that was actually more interesting than the show itself. So, so back in those days, Morton Downey was a, you know, he was like before there was Fox News, you know, before mm -hmm. there was that whole, I mean, you're not old enough to remember Joe Pine and Alan Burke. I'm mm -hmm. sure you don't know who they are. Okay. But in the sixties, we had these really insane TV hosts. You can find them online, Alan Burke and Joe Pine, and they were super right wing, but they weren't called right wing back in those, those days. They were just inflammatory uh tv hosts that were dogmatic and dynamic and they would have all kinds of people on the show and they would like just try to humiliate them all right so this is way before morton Downey. so morton downey was an extension of joe pine and alan burke and i'm old enough to know who joe pine and alan burke is so when i was contacted by the producer of morton downey to be on the show i said to him are, are you fucking kidding me it's a setup. I know how you guys work. I said, I'm a fan of Joe Pine and Alan Burke. I know. And the guy was stunned that I knew. And I said, and I and he goes, I promise more and more attack you. I said, really? I said, well, George Bush wasn't going to be attacked either by Dan Rather. And he was. So why the fuck should I believe you? I said, I said, I said, you just want me for red meat for ratings. And Morton's going to sit there and blow smoke in my face. <laughs> and try to make me look like an idiot and i said i don't frankly i don't need it and i hung up on the guy his name was peter goldsmith as a matter of fact uh -huh. goldsmith uh -huh. and um i hung up on him and he calls me back he goes no 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 we really 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 want you we really need you and i said i don't care what assurances you give me you're full of shit and i hung up on him again and he calls me back and he said we really need you for this segment. And I said, and I heard a desperation in his voice, like a real desperation. And I said, you, this isn't a setup. I said, tell me now. I said, because if I go on, if I come on and he comes over to me and he blows smoke in my face, I'm going to get up and walk off. And I'm telling you that right now. I will get up and I will leave. So he said, I promise you, he will let you say whatever you want to say, and he will not attack you. I promise you, because I need you on this show. So I go out to the studio. I'm in the green room. And in walks the ringer, the great cat. Right. And now I realize what this whole game is, okay? So the great cat was this insane heavy metal violin playing female who was extremely obnoxious in your face. Fuck you. You know, like I'm the best in the world. And she's, she's this kind of a, 
she's the thing she is now i i got it now like this she's going to be the one that's going to be taking the abuse mm -hmm. uh, so 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 i'm in the so i never met cat personally i you know we knew each other because we you know we're in new york scene sure so she she comes into the green room and she immediately starts going up hey how you doing i'm the great cat da, 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 da. Fuck this show fuck these bitches fuck this fuck like she's cursing i'm thinking okay this is really going to be interesting cat's cursing then she walks out of the dressing room and the green room and the line of people you know the audience members yeah. they're in the yeah. hallway and she starts yelling at him you fat fucking people from the midwest fuck you and i'm thinking oh my god this is just the setup of setups and i don't know where i'm going to be placed in all this mess right i want to be lumped in with her or, or what because you know i my radar is up and i'm thinking this is not good you know this isn't good so we go on and and the great cat do you remember her scene do you remember her sequence she's at the podium mm -hmm. yeah she went and off on her she goes off on him yeah he goes off on her yeah but what you don't see because it was taped it wasn't live is that she tells morton downey you know go fuck yourself and she goes to her you go fuck yourself and she says you could suck my dick yeah. this is being, this is a television show right yeah, yeah and he goes i bet you have one <laughs> was a great which was a funny line right yeah, yeah and then the security guards great and they throw out of the studio they physically eject her for real for real yeah so now it's me so we go to commercial break and he comes up to me and he goes that was the entertainment portion and i just need you to do an interview we cool and i went yeah and he let me say what I wanted to say. And Jennifer Norwood said what she wanted to say. And in between commercial breaks, he walks up to me and he goes, are we cool? I go, yeah. He goes, I promise I'd be cool. Oh, yeah, you are. Okay, great. Can we do another segment? Yeah. And we do. And we finish. And at the end, he walks up to me and he goes, thank you for being on the show. And the producer walked up to me and said, see, I told you. And I went, okay. And that's that's really wow. so had, had nothing to do with my conversation with Jennifer Norwood. Yeah. My memory of the show is the game that was played. The setup. It was like a pro wrestling match. You, sure. you follow. Sure. Yeah. I mean, all those shows kind of were. Yes. Except I didn't feel like playing yeah. either. I didn't feel like playing either the, the heel or the or the baby face. You know, I wasn't in the mood. I really there was a message here and I didn't want to play this game. And so the producer, you know, we had a really good relationship. He brought me back a second time just to be a guest on the show. Mm -hmm. He had David Peel on the Lower East Side on, and he wanted me to discuss something in the music business. So I went back on. So that was my memory. And Morton was just, he'd come up to me between takes and go, everything cool? I go, <laughs> yeah. Like he was worried. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine? Because you, you know the kind of image he had, yeah. right? He had that yeah. really crazy fuck you image smoking he was and drinking drink. coffee yeah. yeah and he was fine so there you, there's my there's a not frequently told story for you about <laughs> about, the, about the truth behind the morton downing show which yeah, i, I yeah. have no one has ever asked me before no so kudos to you oh well okay. they've never asked me to and they may have said i saw you on morton downey but i don't think i ever bothered to explain yeah yeah what really went on behind the scenes that that's you know yeah Thanks for that story. That's great. Now, let me ask you this. With the PMRC thing, was that before D got involved in that or was that after? No, that was all, you know, that was a, that uh, that again people people want to um I don't know. You know, you defended the right of people to sing and you did, you know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. all this like bullshit. You know, I looked at it completely differently than anybody else. I I could care less. I just wanted mm -hmm. to sell records. And if this sure. was controversial sure. enough to sell records, I was all for it. Ban me. I don't care. Like, you know what I mean? Like uh, all these, oh, we shouldn't be banned. Listen, Twisted Sister became unhip very fast. And the only way we could be hip again was to be banned. Mm -hmm. So I was all for it. You know, I mean, I was all like personally going, 
okay, ban me. I need, yeah. I need bad, yeah. I need some bad publicity now. I need young people to know that we're serious because they just think we're like a goofy video joke. Right. Because we went from super hip to like a video joke in six months. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's the sad truth. Is we were smart enough to create an amazing video, but we weren't smart enough to figure out how to extricate ourselves from the goofiness of it. You know, there's a portion of rock music. I call it the goofball era of Devo, the Bangles, the Go-Go's, B-52's, those funny videos, you know, those Mm -hmm. gimmicky videos. Mm -hmm. They're they're like eating brownies, a lot of sugar. You know, it's fun to eat a brownie. Eat too many brownies, you get sick. Goofball videos get boring after a while, and the bands that make them lose credibility pretty quickly. The reason why Van Halen didn't become a goofball video band if given David Lee Ross predilection would have been, but Eddie Van Halen was such a monstrously phenomenal musician that he was able to, you know, keep the credibility mm-hmm. of the, and then when David was ejected, Sammy Hagar came on and he's a great singer, you know, a yeah. legitimately yeah. great singer, writer, front man. I love Sammy. And, and what Sammy did was he righted the ship pretty much. That's why there's, you know, that's why I think the element of Van Halen after David was a better version of Van Halen. That's my own personal opinion. But David, as entertaining as he was, and he was very entertaining, so don't get me wrong. I like entertaining frontmen, but he was like a goofball Mm -hmm. in a way. And and I think he I think he hurt the credibility in a way. Personal opinion. Now, ZZ Top, here's a band that had a goofball image with. um, legs you know and, and 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 give me all your love but their songs were so strong and their credibility was so was so deep because of the years before of developing such a touring base that they were and also they they weren't threatening sexually they just looked like your grandfather like you know like there was a certain they pulled it off mm-hmm. they successfully pulled off the goofy side and then righted the ship in a way, but you know what I'm talking about with that yeah. whole era of MTV, yeah. where it kind of got too gimmicky after a while, sure. right? Sure. But this this was this is what I'm talking about. We, on the other hand, rather than rather than making the right decision to release, let's say, "Fire Still Burns" as the first single off of "Come Out and Play," it should have been "Fire Still Burns" or "Come Out and Play," and establish the band as a hell-raising heavy metal band. We came out with "Leader of the Pack," yeah. which, even though yeah. that song was a popular song in the bars and it worked, that's why we tried it because we used to play it in the bars and our fans in the bars loved it. We figured, well, we can't be making a mistake because they got it. And in England, we used to play in England and they got it, so we figured, well, it's people get it. It's kind of an inside joke, mm. but it it was the it was a, the that was the mistake. Mm. So had we not done that, I don't know if you're familiar with the Come Out and Play album, but had we followed up Stay Hungry with Come Out and Play and the song Come Out and Play or Fire Still Burns with a heavy video, like very, very, very heavy, it would have changed, it would have altered the trajectory right. of that. Yeah, because you guys had both, um, we're not going to take it and um, I want to rock. I want to rock were comical videos. And the price was a straight ahead performance video. Mm-hmm. Don't make up. You guys were also in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, was kind of, which was comical. Yeah, the except that our, except within the context of that movie, we were a heavy metal rock band making a video within his movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we weren't necessarily goofy. We were doing burn it. You know, we were recording a video, Burn in Hell, within the context of his movie. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of hip and fun to mm-hmm. do. It's fun to be on the set. I, I, I didn't know who Pee Wee Herman was. We were on tour in, in the Far East and we, we were told we were going to be in this movie. And I said, who the hell is Pee Wee Herman? Oh, he's got a kid show. I said, well, why would we be in this movie? Oh, it's a really kind of cool show. He's got a great vibe. I had no idea who he was. Really? And, yeah. I'm, and I'm on the set. We're on the set. That's actually another great story for you. I'm on the set. And I'm staying there in my full, you know, Twisted Sister J.J. French get up, sunglasses, makeup. I'm staying in full, like, drag, whatever. 
And Paul Rubens walks over, complete dress as Pee Wee Herman. It's the first time I, I don't know him at all, but I'm assuming that's Pee Wee Herman. And he walks up to me and he goes, hi, I'm Paul. Thank you very much for being in the movie, which is fine. He wasn't in character. Uh -huh. He wasn't uh -huh. portraying some bullshit L.A. star. He's basically saying, I'm a performer. You're a performer. Thanks for being in my movie. I shake his hands, go, thanks for thinking of us, right? So now we're filming the movie, like we're filming our scene, right? So now, do you know that this is Tim Burton's first movie? I did not know that. Did yeah, not know so that Tim was Burton's first. a director, mm -hmm. right? So he's not famous at that point. He's just a director making a movie, okay? I mean, he may have made a movie beforehand, but this is Tim Burton's like first. <laughs> so we're on the set, we're on the, we're on the car hood. If you remember the scene, we're making this video. We're saying, see, you know, we mm -hmm. we're doing yeah, burning hell. And uh, the car is going down the street. And Pee Wee comes around in a bicycle and he's running away from the bad guys. And he gets involved in our video shoot. And then a, bo a boat comes out and crashes into the car and we run. OK, that's 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 what happens. OK, right, right. so we're on the car. We had just flown back from Australia. So we were pretty jet lagged, like I'm really tired, you know, like tired. But we are on the Paramount lot. You know, we're, we're stars now. So I guess I'm supposed to be thrilled and happy that my rock and roll dreams have been realized and that now we're super famous. Big video, top 10, singles huge, MTV, top 10 video. Everybody knows Twitter's and Sister. All these years of struggle have finally paid off. I'm now famous, but I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. That's all I really want to do is go to sleep. So I'm on the car and we're filming the scene and the, and the cherry picker comes down with Tim Burton you know, with the director's horn mega, megaphone and the head cameraman is in the cherry picker and they zoom right into the hood and the head cameraman goes, stop. So we're looking around. What do we do wrong? Dee's looking around like, was he not lip syncing correctly? You know, head camera guy looks at me and he goes, excuse me, is your name John Segal? That's my real name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he goes, I used to live in your apartment building in Manhattan. Your mother and me used to be on the Tennis Association together. No. That was the, that was the funniest part of making that video. Wow. wow. He stops wow. the movie because the head camera guy used to be a tenant in my apartment <laughs> building in Manhattan and was on the Tennis Association with my mom. Wow. What are, the, what are the chances of that? Right. Like, what are the chances of that? And like, you know, the joke was with the band members, I knew people all around the world. They would go to me, do you know everybody on the planet? So here we are in L.A. filming a video and the camera guy says, are you John Segal? <laughs> and he gave me the address, which I'm not going to say, yeah. you know, goes, you used to live at so blah, blah, blah. Yeah. He goes, yeah. Well, your mother and I used to be in the tennis association together. Did you? I looked around. I remembered him. You did? I did remember, I, I yeah, he remember he saw me his apartment. I went, oh, my God, Peter. His name is Peter something. And I went, oh, my God, you're Peter whatever last name. Oh, the guys had to be looking at you like, what the hell? What the hell? Yeah. Pretty, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of shit that kind of like makes you go, oh, OK, brings you yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, JJ, you have um, a book that you've released, what, about seven, eight months ago? Yeah. Yeah. About six months ago. OK. Twisted Business. It's uh, your lessons. Lessons in rock and roll, life. right? It's a bizwar, as you call it. Yeah, it's a business book and a memoir. Mm -hmm. Tell me about like, it's a very interesting approach to writing a book. A lot of your peers and stuff write books, but that you know, it's their partying stories and that kind of stuff. Yours is, tells your story, but it also tells uh, more of the behind the scenes business stuff kind of thing of how you approached it. Well, first of all, I'd like to think that the story of Twisted Sister gets told in interesting ways, no matter who tells the story. For example, our documentary, mm -hmm. We're Twisted mm -hmm. Fucking Sister, is not your normal documentary. Mm -hmm. the documentary has nothing to do with the period of time of we're not going to take it and I want to rock. In fact, the documentary ends at the very point that we sign the record deal that leads to those songs. The documentary was about the story of the struggle to get, to get signed, which took 10 years which right. is well, unlike anyone. anybody's story. Yeah. Anyone's story. I mean, you know, the Beatles can, you can sell you want the Beatles, you know, played in Hamburg for three years, you know, and I go, that's right. They did. And they killed themselves. That's great. But we blew that number out the window. We're at 10 years. Yeah. And I mean, not only did we blow that number out the window, but 
I'll put this in perspective for you. Mm -hmm. When a band comes to me and asks me to see them these days, let's say the kids are 20, 21 years old, and they go, would you come see my band? The first thing I'll say is, how many shows have you played? How many years have you been together? Two years. How many shows have you played? 50 shows. Like, that's a lot of shows. Like I said, I said 50 what? 50, like, 45-minute sets? Yeah. yeah, man, that's a lot. I go, yeah, okay, it's a lot. Uh, let me tell you, in the first 30 months of Twisted Sisters' existence, from March, mid-March 1973 to Labor Day Sunday 1975, Twisted Sister had played 3,450 45 minute sets. 3,400, not 345, 3,450. So when I say to a band, well, when you get to 500 shows, call me, I'll come down and see you. And they go, we'll never get to that. And I go, well, there's a good chance I'm never going to fucking come and see you. Because <laughs> the chances are you'll suck until you hit about 500 shows. And I don't really have the time to watch you suck. And I said, and you have every right to suck. Because you're a band, so you're starting out, you know, learn your shit, and I'll come down and see you eventually. Yeah. I'm not coming down yeah. now, you know. So anyway, um, so putting that aside, the story of the band is unusual. I know it's unusual. I'm also a good storyteller. And when I told people I was writing a book, they said, oh, that's really cool, man. What's it like? It's like autobiography. Well, it's kind of an autobiography, but it's kind of like a business. It's like a memoir, but it's also a business book. Well, what is it, man? Is it a business book or is it a memoir? Well, do you remember the movie Chinatown with Jack Nicholson? Do you remember? Did you ever see Chinatown? Well, there's a famous scene in the very end where he's where Faye Dunaway's character is being slapped in the face because someone's saying, who are you? I'm her mother. I'm her sister. I'm her mother. I'm her sister. Well, I felt like saying it's a business book. It's a memoir. It's a business book. It's a memoir. So I coined this phrase called Bizwar. It's a business book and a memoir. It can't not be that. In fact, if any story about a businessman who's successful it could be Steve Jobs, Elon Musk is a bizwar. Right. Because I love that name. How, yeah. Because how you grow up, how you run your business is a reflection of your lessons in life. That's how you become what you become. That's why it's a bizwar. Where did you get your business sense from? I mean, were your parents like that or did they install that in you? Or no, you I was a I was a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. from between the ages of 15 and 20 and and my father was a jewelry salesman and so i was kind of like you know i was a pretty freewheeling hippie druggy drug dealer and um mostly weed you know mostly although it got it got into much heavier drugs later on but mostly weed so i was ahead of my time by 50 years i told people to get in the pot you know 1967 you guys now getting into it everyone's going to weed and no one listened then. Everyone's jumping in the pot bandwagon now. But I was selling a lot of weed and had, making a lot of money for the only express purpose of buying guitars and amps because my parents didn't have the money. They, they were middle class and they wouldn't give me money. So I said, well, if you're not going to give me money, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take care of this myself. Mm -hmm. So starting at 15, I started selling weed. And, you know, I became very successful. Mm -hmm. you know, meaning, meaning, to be clear. Meaning I made enough money to buy all the guitars I wanted, all the amps I wanted, and see all the rock and roll shows I wanted to see and get stoned the whole time. Mm -hmm. So I was I was dealing, I was playing guitar, I was involved in anti-war activities, I was multitasking at a very high level, stoned out of my mind. And eventually the drug dealing led to international dealing in Europe. And Amsterdam, especially during the summer of 71, I, you know, the hippie, that was the hippie period. Yeah. 1967 yeah. and 1972, if you didn't live through it, you don't understand it. But if you lived through it and you were a teenager, oh, my God. You know, I was 10 years old when the Beatles came to America. I was 20 when they broke up. I had them at the, at the, the heart of my life. You know, I always say the music you listen to between the ages of 10 and 20 is the music that you will love for the rest of your life. It's just I the agree. music that... That's just, you can never get rid of that music. That's the music that is more deeply ingrained in your heart than any other music. doesn't mean you can't love new groups, find new groups, whatever. But the music you listen to between 10 and 20 is, is, is codified in your brain. Mm -hmm. Well, I had the Beatles, the Stones, Who's Zepp, Floyd, you know, Hendrix. <laughs> to the age of 10 and 20, I had the best. Yeah. Now I mean, were, I had the best. You were a deadhead, right? You, you were I was a Grateful Dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Garcia gave me a tab of acid at a Grateful Dead concert. Does it get any more official? You know? <laughs> but I talked to Grateful Dead heads on the hey, man, I saw the dead 400 times. I said, great. But I saw them with Pigpen 27 times. So fuck you. Like, because you can't you can't tell me that. In fact, the director of their documentary, the co-producers 
are Justin Kreutzman, Bill Kreutzman's son, and Mark Pincus, president of Rhino. Both of those guys produced the dead documentary. Neither one of them was born when I saw The Grateful Dead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, Justin Kreutzman was one year old at Woodstock. I'd already seen him 25 times. So when I had Justin on my on my podcast, I said, you know, it's ironic because you're the son of the now, here's the funny thing. So I make a joke of the Grateful Dead in my in the documentary. I say I saw the dead 27 times, 26 times on acid. And the 27th time I saw him straight and it was the worst band I ever heard in my life. That's what I say in the documentary. And I walked out on them, which is true. Yeah, this is true. And I never saw them again. This is true. I was done. Yeah. And it was right when the glitter thing happened. So I transferred over. However, I will have to say that the dead's 26 times on acid was some of the greatest experiences of my life. So I say this in the documentary, but I make the joke. I said on the 27th time I saw him straight and it was the worst man I ever heard in my life. That's what's what I say in the documentary. I got an email when the documentary came out and it said, Hey, JJ, I just saw what you said about the band signed Justin Kreutzman. So I'm thinking Kreutzman, isn't that the name of the drummer? So I emailed him back. I said, you wouldn't be related to the drummer. He goes, yeah, it's my dad. He goes, that's the funniest fucking line I ever heard in my life. <laughs> so I played it back five times. So we became friends. Yeah. Anyway, awesome. I was a, yeah, I was a deadhead, and I and I'm proud. I was proud to be a deadhead. I really got him. I mean, people don't understand him. He's noodling mm -hmm. at the peak mm -hmm. of their Oxomoxoa phase, you know, and the Anthem of the Sun phase, and all the crazy shit. I I understood it. I got it. Mm -hmm. Most people didn't get it, but you know, the Grateful Dead are like really a jazz band is really what they are. They're a jazz band dressed up as a rock band, but they're an improv band. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some nights are going to be better than others. Sure. You know, as, sure. a, as opposed to bands like Twisted, that is a very produced band. We put on a show. And the show is very precise because that's what our fans want. They yeah. want yeah. what we're giving them and the Deadheads fans get what they want. You know, I, Which I never, is, I never got to see you guys live. I was so, I wish I would have, but I, I went to every show back in the day. I mean, Motley, uh, Poison, you know, all the bands, but I lived down in Florida and I was looking through your book. You had all your dates in the back of that book. You didn't come to Florida much. I think you were there with Iron Maiden. Yeah. We played a couple of shows in Florida. Never yeah. made it through that much. It's hard to explain. I can't yeah. explain. Maybe you know, like had we done another leg of a tour, we would have come back to Florida or whatever. Mm -hmm. we, we just didn't. It just didn't happen. Like yeah. that. I mean, mm -hmm. look, there's a lot of things that should have happened that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And that's one of them. We didn't spend enough time in the Southeast. Mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've seen your shows. I've looked up shows on YouTube and stuff, you know, and saw some old live shows. And and I got to say, you guys were tight. And that comes from all those shows, I'm sure. Well, we were really super band, and that's why we were always um, voted best band in any show. It didn't matter who, it didn't matter what. I mean, look, the fact is, when band came back in nineteen in two thousand and three, and we headlined one hundred and twenty five of the biggest festivals in the world from nineteen yeah. from two thousand three to two thousand sixteen. So let's suppose you're not a Twisted Sister fan. Let's suppose you just don't like my band, and like you wish I would just shut the fuck up and disappear. Okay. Well, there's some a couple of truths that you have to know whether you like it or not. Truth one, we've sold 25 million records, whether you like it or not. Truth two, we're one of the few bands in the world where a promoter trusts us with 100,000 people. And there's very few bands that, that have that trust. But we're one of the few bands where a promoter says, I know I can put this band on a closing night of a world-class festival, and they will make everybody happy. And you yeah. better be fucking good to do that. Because if you suck, the whole reputation of the festival suffers. Mm -hmm. So for absolute undeniable fact, we are one of maybe 30 acts in the world that can play to 100,000 people. And we retired at that level. So we didn't lose, we didn't drop off last tour. A couple of the shows on the tour, we played to over 100,000 people a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's, that's fact. And the third fact, which is the most interesting fact, is, is that um, five bands, uh, five, five particular bands were created in 73. Priest, Judas Priest, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss, and Twisted Sister. Now, Judas Priest, an incredible band. Kiss, an incredible band. ACDC, an incredible band. Aerosmith, an incredible band. If you ask a 10-year-old kid to sing any song by those bands, a 10-year-old kid will not know their song. You ask a kid to sing, we're not going to take it. And what do you think that kid's going to do? He's going to sing. Know it. 
we're not going to take it because we have licensed our material more than any other band. We have we are the most licensed heavy metal band in the world. Our songs are in more TV shows, soundtracks, commercials than any other band. Mm -hmm. And we made we made a conscious effort to do that because I need to make sure succeeding generations know who we are. That's why. So to me, that's why, for example, um, Discover Card, just license, we're not going to take it for 2022. The ad's going to start running in about a month. It's going to be all over the place for a year. But we constantly keep our song out there. So what happens is the Ukrainian freedom fighters, they're singing, we're not going to take it. In London during Brexit, they sang, we're not going to Brexit. Two days ago, somebody sent me a video in Spain of a bunch of people before the big soccer match with 155,000 people. And I've got like 10,000 people singing, we're not going to take it in Spanish. So this is the international appeal. Mm -hmm. We don't want to get, I won't get into the politics of it because it's used by both the left and the right. Sure. As a, as a theme song. And my whole position is I want to get anyone to use it. I mean, I want, I want the song to be used. I yeah, want the world to matter. hear it. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I have my own personal opinions. That's for sure. But, you know, to me, it's like, um get the song out there that's yeah. what's important now do you guys own all of your music or, no no neither does 99.99 percent .99 of the yeah. artists out yeah so when yeah. taylor swift makes a big deal boo-hoo i'm a slave well fuck it we're all slaves taylor yeah. i mean it's yeah. like it's not because you're a chick you know what i mean it's like yeah. we're all in the same yeah. boat the beatles zeppelin <laughs> the who we're all in the same boat. Right? We're all in the exact same position. Now, you you can re-record your songs right. and own oh. them, which is what we did. Oh, you did? Okay. We recorded our hits and we sell our re-records. However, nice. when you own a song, people do not quite understand what that means. So there's two parts to a song, ownership. One is the master recording. That's the record you listen to. Okay, that's the master. And the other is the rights to the actual song itself. Those are owned by publishing companies. Mm -hmm. And 99.9% .9 of artists have sold their publishing right. to a third party at some point in their life for a lot of money. And our publishing was sold. So we don't own our publishing. So technically speaking, if you want to use a song by Twisted Sister, you have to first go to the publishing company and work out a deal with them. Mm -hmm. Then if you want to do it, you come to me and I will sell you the master use but you'll be using our version so i've told every band i know that has hit records we record your own songs okay. it's one of the few it's one of the very few clauses in a recording contract that's pro artist most clauses are not mm -hmm. most clauses mm -hmm. are horribly restrictive and almost slave labor yeah in reality yeah, I, I, I know rat did that with that geico commercial they recorded round and round good good for them but you know we did this 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. no, you did. 90 percent of the time you hear our song, it's our own version of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did it. We did it because I read that clause. I read that contract 20 years ago and went, what the fuck? Let's just re-record everything. So we went and we record everything. Right. But that clause did, has been there. Did you when you guys were coming up in the scene and you know first getting into the record labels and stuff, were you one that read your contracts or did you trust those to others? Uh, I think in the very earliest days, if you look at my first management contract, I signed a horrible management contract. I wasn't paying attention. Look, when I joined the band, I was 20 years old and I joined the band as a guitar player. Nothing yeah. more than that. I was a hired guy. I mean, I was a partner in the Twisted Sister, but I was just a musician. If you were to ask me, you know, this is 50 years ago. Yeah. If you were to ask anybody, 50, if you got asked the guys in Kiss or Judas Priest or Aerosmith, or ACDC, 50 years ago, how long do you think their band would last? I guarantee you we'd all say five years. That was like the, that was the automatic answer. Yeah, That was it. Yeah. Maybe we would have said 10 only because the Beatles lasted 10, but for the most part, we would have said five. I would have said five. I mean, who knew? Here we are 50 years later. Now right. it's a testament, it's a testament to the greatness of KISS this is why I was so pissed off with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know, when I wasn't a fan of it until they inducted Kiss, they had no right. 
Kiss represents, how do you not, I don't care if you don't like the image, how do you, how do you not respect what they've done? I mean, it's, sure. it's mind blowing. Sure. You don't have to love their music. You know, they were a rock band. They dreamed about being rock stars. They did exactly what they're supposed to do. They create, in fact, I'll go even further. You ask me the three most important guitar players, electric guitar players and, and, and American guitar players, I'd say Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, and Ace Frehley. Now, Ace Frehley can't compete with Jimi and Eddie technically, but I'll bet you more kids dreamed about being rock stars watching Ace play with Kiss sure, than watching Eddie Van Halen or Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, I had the temporary okay. Ace tattoos on me when I was a kid. Right. So you don't have to tell me if Ace is great or he's not great. Keith Richards isn't great either. But how many people want to be how many people want to become famous rock stars because Keith Richards? Right. Keith mm -hmm. is Keith. Fuck me. Keith is fucking Keith. Yeah. He earned yeah. it, man. He earned that. He earned that embodiment of what rock and roll is. And so whatever that ephemeral rock and roll stick is, the fact that Kiss was ignored really angered me. Because it's basically saying we're elitist and we don't want to respect it. And I go, how do you not respect a rock and roll band that went out? And by the way, when rock was going through its difficult periods, various times in the music industry, who kept rock alive? Foreigner kept rock alive. Ario Speedwagon kept rock alive. Journey kept rock alive. Kiss, you know, like these arena groups. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they're so, dis they're so disrespected by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. They're so incredibly disrespected. And I said, we're not talking about Chopin and Mozart. We're talking about pop music. You know, it's pop music. It's popular culture music. If you don't recognize the value of popular culture music that made millions of people happy, whether you consider these people smart or not, is beyond my... And I'm a New York kid, so you would think I would say, oh, yeah, I want Blondie, Talking Heads, Patti Smith. Like, that's what I want, the cool hip. No. I want bands that have reached the masses and have meant something to gigantic bodies of people. Those are the bands that had the most impact to me. Patti Smith is fine. She shouldn't be in the Rock and Hall of Fame. I mean, she's just because she doesn't deserve to be there. There's so many more people that deserve to be there. If she's going to be in there, then a lot of other people need to be in there. It's not that I don't like her, but it's, it's an equivocation. You know, it's like, Show me the acts that impacted more people worldwide. We're not in there. Mm -hmm. We have played to millions of people. We've, we've headlined 40 countries. We've been around 50 years. We've sold 25 million records. I've got 37 Golden Platinum albums from eight countries around the world. I'm sorry, what do you have to do to be in the Rock and Hall of Fame exactly? Like, <laughs> what exactly do you have to prove? Our songs are the most licensed songs in the world. More people know we're not going to take it than almost any other song but that's not valuable. Have you been nominated at all? Like, have you Never. come up on the ballots? Never. Where? I don't think ever. Hmm. Hmm. And, and, and I'm torn between, I'm torn between either pushing it or just saying, fuck it. I don't mm -hmm. care. The priest is in it this year. Yeah. And I love, I love Judas priest. I mean, I love him. I'm ha I have Rob Halford on my podcast tomorrow. Oh, nice. As a, well, because Rob Halford is a prostate cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. So am I. Mm -hmm. So, Talking about prostate cancer on my on the zero prostate cancer podcast, which is I don't know the broadcast date. By the way, the 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 uh, the sirens you're hearing yeah. is because I live in Manhattan. Yeah, <laughs> you know, in New York. It's not like I'm in the and that's like it's not like I'm in the witness protection program and they're coming <laughs> after me. Okay, um, but I have Rob Halford on um, because he's a prostate cancer survivor, and these days I'm working hard to bring knowledge. Um, and information and education to men. Yeah, so that I wanted, hope, I, I wanted you know, to talk to you about that a little bit um, with the prostate cancer. I mean, you 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 don't have cancer now, correct? Okay. When did you realize that there was something going on? I mean, how did you find out? My father died of it in '84, so my brother and I suspected we could possibly carry the gene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My father died. 19, in fact, he died the day Stay Hungry went platinum. Talk about a bittersweet. Oh, wow. Yeah. Day, right. So I can't ever think about that day in a way that you would like to celebrate a day sure. like that. Right. Because my father died that week. Thankfully, the record label, 
I asked him to get a, a, a platinum album to him before he died. And they got one to him. And I have a photo of him holding the platinum album. He died a week later. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so from a symbolic standpoint, you know, I said to them, I said, the label, is it going to be platinum? They said, yes. I said, are you sure? They said, yes. Can you make a platinum album for my father? He's got like maybe two weeks to live. And they got him a platinum album. That photo is in very, your book, isn't it? Yeah. I'm very okay. grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so my brother and I kind of talked about it and said, well, he died at 74, undiagnosed, and it was all in his bones. So he's had it for years. We figured he had it for years. So we figured we better start watching. My brother's 10 years older than me. So he got prostate cancer at the age of 66. I was 56 at the time. So I started getting checked at 56. And then I had multiple biopsies because my PSA number was climbing. And during that 10 year period of time to 66, when I was diagnosed, I had done all the research, found the doctors, the hospital I wanted to go to. I did all that stuff. So the minute they said, you got prostate cancer, it was done. So you were almost expecting it. Expecting At some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely It wasn't a matter of if, Mm -hmm. it's a matter of when. Now you could say, well, two sisters, one has breast cancer, one doesn't. There's no automatic. I didn't have the BRCA gene, which is the same gene, I think, for breast cancer. My brother and I don't have the BRCA gene. But my PSA started rising at the same profile that his PSA rose. So it seemed to me like it was coming. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants to hear you have cancer. I guarantee nobody wants to hear those words. But at least when they told me I have cancer, I went, okay, guess what? First operation date is when? Yeah. Give me that day. Mm -hmm. Here's the plan. So they, my, they, they gave me a radical prostatectomy and they found no other cancer anywhere in the adjoining tissue. I didn't have radiation. I didn't have C's. I didn't have chemo. They just go into my prostate cancer. I'm four years since the operation. Now, when you said to me, you don't have cancer, let me be clear about what I believe that means. Once you have cancer, I don't care how many years they tell you that you don't have cancer, but once you have it, if only one cell got out and floated through your body, 10 years later shows up some other place, it can show up. Mm -hmm. So as of my last blood test last month, I don't have prostate cancer, Mm -hmm. but I know three guys who got prostate cancer again 10 years later, wow. 10, 12, 14 years later. And then they had radiation. Mm-hmm. So, um, and my, my urologist, who's also on my podcast about two months ago, said it just takes one cell, float around for a couple of years, you know, and then decide, oh, I like this kidney. I like this liver. Mm-hmm. I like this brain. <laughs> I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to have a home here. here. Yeah. 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 So I, so I think you have to just be smart. So this has led me to speak to many guys because now people are you know comfortable talking about it. I get emails all the time. Thank you, JJ, for talking about it. I really appreciate that. You've really educated me. And in the last couple of months, I spoke to a 69 year old guy with stage four prostate cancer. He never knew he had it. It's already in his bones, but, and I've known this guy for most of his life. So that that was crazy. And then I, then a, a fan of mine contacted me, 46 years old, stage four, wow. three kids. Wow. And, and he may not make it because it was so far gone. You know, once it gets into your lymph nodes mm-hmm. and into your bones, mm-hmm. that becomes a whole other thing. I don't know if you have cancer in your family. I do. My, both my parents died of cancer. And what kind of cancer did they have? My dad had, well, he had it all over. It was in his stomach and his liver. It was everywhere. I mean, when, when he found out he had cancer, he died a month later. Okay. And how old was he at the time? 70. Okay. And did they ever find out where it started from? No, not that I'm aware of. Mm-mm. It usually starts, I mean, it starts somewhere. Yeah. It finds a home somewhere and then it explodes. Yeah. And my father, my father they, they said through the biopsies and the autopsy that they traced it back to his prostate. Mm. Because a prostate cancer cell has a particular profile. That's why a PSA test, a, a prostate-specific antigen, that's the PSA test that they give you, the blood test. Mm-hmm. That's how come they know it's prostate cancer versus stomach cancer versus another kind of cancer. Now, is there symptoms for it? 
like, will you know maybe there's something wrong without before you get a blood test? I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Is, is there any symptoms that go with it? Like, you know, you'll know something might be wrong before you get the test? Um, unfortunately, there can be no symptoms or mm -hmm. there can be some symptoms. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the guys I know who've had stage four, their symptoms led them to the doctor and it was too late. Yeah. Kind of like pancreatic so, cancer. Usually it's it was in their, it was in their back. It was like lower back pain could denote prostate cancer. Well, lower back pain could denote a million things, right? Sure. A million things. But one of the things that stage four prostate cancer sh it shows up in your back because your your rib cage, your bones, your hip bones start mm. to deteriorate because it's in your bones. So um, one of the, the guy who had the forty six year old guy, he, he had trouble peeing. Mm. So it mm. could be any problem, prostate problem blockage enlarged prostate inflammation you know it doesn't mean you have cancer but there are like you said about pancreatic cancer mm -hmm. there's no symptoms all mm -hmm. of a sudden you got pancreatic cancer you didn't know right. you had pancreatic cancer so, so so is it now the blood test to get tested for it is that just like they can do that when they t do regular blood tests yeah, it's a, okay. it's part of your regular checkup. You get a PSA. Okay. So in the United States, in the United States, they say that a PSA below 4.0 pretty much means you don't have prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. To be clear, and let me be really clear about this. This is an American Medical Association decision. This is not agreed to in Europe. They don't agree that 4.0 means anything at all. And in the US, they'll tell you, that just because your number is higher than four doesn't mean you have it. And just because it's lower than four doesn't mean you have don't have it. Mm -hmm. What happens with PSA is that any jump in the number over a short period of time denotes cancer. Mm -hmm. So let's say, let's just say you went for your first blood test and your PSA was 5.7. Let's just say for the purposes of this conversation, sure. you never had a they'll say, come back in six months. In six months, if it's five, seven, they may do a biopsy. But if it's not moving anywhere, you just may have a high PSA number. And if it stays at five, seven, or five, nine, and five, four, and just all it stays in that range, then that's just because you have a high PSA number, mm -hmm. which could mean nothing. It's rapid increase over a short period of time. So let's say you've always had, like my cousin had a 2-1 for years. For years, all of a sudden he had a 3-1. Mm. And then six or so he had a 4-1. And then a year later, a 5-1. Ah, now that. Something's going on. Something's going on. So, you know, uh, education is important. Reading about it is important. Having a good urologist is important. A good access to a hospital. But sticking your head under the covers and not wanting to know is not a good idea. Yeah. And men, yeah. men don't like to talk about it. Hmm. They don't. Hmm. Men don't like to talk about cancer. Yeah. Did they you, don't like to talk about prostate cancer. The first year I did, I didn't want anybody to know. And then I thought, what? It's bullshit. What? So no one's going to hire me to talk. No one's going to, uh, I'm going to lose my friends. Like, that's stupid. You know, I mean, I'd rather save a life than worry about my own petty narcissistic and you yeah. uh, having the platform that you have, are, that that's great that you do talk about it. Yeah, I talk about it freely. Yeah, in every in every kind of um, platform I can. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get Rob Halford to want to do that too because he hasn't really talked a lot about it. So I will find out tomorrow how um, how much he wants to talk about it. Now, let me just say this about my brother: he doesn't like to talk about it. Mm. I asked him once, why isn't he part of a support group? He says I don't want to talk about it. He goes, in my mind, I don't have it. It's out of my head. And I spoke to a couple of people about it, and they went, that's well, fine, too. You know, psychological stuff. You know, that's, sure. that's, your that's your choice to make. I'm not going to sit there and go, you have to go to a support group. Yeah. If that's how you feel about it, that you had it, you don't have it, you don't want to think about it, eh, fine. Mm -hmm. I look mm -hmm. at it and go, I want to talk about it now. I want to educate men about what to do, how to recognize it, and what to do about it if you have it and the options you've got. I have no skin in the game, meaning I have no monetary gain anyway. 
with a company, a medical company. I mean, right now the Bayer company, I'm, I'm part of their program, but they're not paying me. Mm -hmm. I'm simply involved in trying to spread the word that early treatment is the difference. And you know, that's no different in almost any disease, right? What do they talk about breast cancer? Woman, yeah, yeah. get a mess, yeah, yeah. get a, right? Get, get, you know, get, get tested, get a mammogram. If it's suspicious, check it out. Most people hate doctors. Most people don't want to know about that shit. And prostate cancer, you know, women talk about breast cancer way more than men ever talk about prostate cancer. In fact, do you know that the breast cancer research raises four times more money a year than prostate cancer? And prostate cancer is a male. So you'd think that men, you know, would be ponying up more money given the profile of the male domination, you know, the patriarchal society we're in. Sure. No. Sure. You watch football wow. games, so breast cancer, pink shoes, right? Like it's all right, supporting right, right. women's health, which is great. Baseball players, football players, they have prostate, they have breast cancer week, day, month, year. The NFL invests money, the MLB, you know, that's great. No one does that for prostate cancer. Right. Huh. Well, that's great and that you're same, talking about it. And the same percentage, I think we're dealing in the same percentage, 10% of women get breast cancer. 10% of men get prostate cancer. Well, I'll tell you just from us talking right now, next I get blood work every six months just for my cholesterol. I'm going to ask about my PSA next time. Yeah, just do it. Yeah. You got my email. If you have any questions, let me know. I will, I will definitely. And I'll tell you also, my demographic for this show is about 40 to 50 year old male. So, which is the start mm -hmm. of where you really have to start looking. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, in the book, the twisted method. I talk about the twisted method of reinvention, which is tena which is I take the word twisted and divide it up into seven letters. Right. And right. I use examples: tenacity, wisdom, inspiration, stability, trust, excellence, and discipline. These are the seven lessons of, of twisted sister becoming successful. Why did I do that? I did it because the cliched expectation of a rock band success is that it's sex, drugs, rock and roll, and some sort of fairy dust. You made a deal with the devil and somehow you, you know, became successful. And it wasn't, it was just fucking hard work. Mm -hmm. And I take everybody through the steps in my book of how Twisted became successful. We worked our ass off you did. to become you successful. Did. Yeah. And the book has all the shows in the back of the book. There's 9,000 performances. It's a hell of a lot of performances. <laughs> You know, it's a lot of shows. 10 years, yeah. right? Before you really got your shot? Before we got signed, yeah. 10 yeah. solid years before That's, we ever got signed. That, you know, I talk to a lot of bands, a lot of musicians on here. A lot of them you probably know. Um, but a lot, some of them will say, I say, how long did it take you to get your record deal? Eight months, two years. And here you guys are, one of the biggest bands in the world. It took you 10 years. Yeah. And, 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 and learning our craft in the bars packing the bars, playing to thousands of people because the club scene was unlike any other club scene in the United States. Drinking age was 18 and the clubs held up to 5,000 people playing cover material. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist in any way now. You know? mm -hmm. But back then, that's the scene. So we were able to use that as a, jump, as a, as a jumping off point. Oh, yeah. So I'm very proud of it. I don't hold it against any band for making it at whatever level they made it at. Sure. I only can say that for Twisted, that was the work and energy put in so that when d came in the band three years after the band started we already had i would already had 3400 shows under my belt before the record deal with d we had put another 3400 shows under our belt so we were at like seven or eight thousand shows before the record deal yeah. okay amazing so when people want to know how come we were so good live well, here's the truth. If you still suck after 8,000 shows, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong business. What was the, what do you think was the holdup? Oh, well, I describe it in the book, you know, just a confluence of circumstances. It just didn't look a lot of times great performers don't succeed. Mm -hmm. And performers we not may not think are great do succeed. Mm -hmm. That's just mm -hmm. the way life. That's just the way life deals you. We had a unbelievably unbending belief that we were good so every time we got rejected we didn't believe the rejection was real like we just kept coming back and pushing you know we were turned down more times than a bed sheet in a whorehouse and we came back more times than freddy krueger and michael myers you know you guys gotta keep i mean if you look at the twisted method of reinvention the t for the first t is for tenacity 
well, what else can I say? Mm -hmm. You know, rock and roll is a entrepreneurial business. And if you're in business for yourself, tenacity is the single greatest asset you have. Because without tenacity, you have nothing. So the good news about being an entrepreneur is that you make your own rules. The bad news is that you make your own rules, which means that you have to succeed. Your success and failure is based upon how much work you put into it. Right. You know, it's not working a nine to five job, you know, and being getting a nice paycheck and doing the job and going home and let somebody else worry about it. The music industry is basically entrepreneurial, which means you have to take all the risks. So when you take those risks, you chant, you, you, you stand to lose big or win big. Mm -hmm. And the losses at high levels are tough to take. Any team that loses the World Series hurts like a motherfucker. Yeah. Anyone who comes yeah. in on a silver medal at the Olympics hurts because you want the gold medal. You want to be number one. And to be number two is all that work and number two. So Twisted didn't want to be number two or number 80. We wanted to be number one. And we fought and fought and fought until we were number one. But you know what happens to a lot of groups? A lot of groups fight the world to become successful. And once they become successful, they turn internally and they fight themselves. And that's what happens with the band. We fought ourselves and, and, right. and we, we stopped. And then we were smart enough to figure it out and come back. After a 12-year hiatus, we came back in 2003. We were only supposed to come back for a year. We had a 14-year reunion, mm -hmm. which we became, in which we became one of the biggest live concert attractions in the world. And we released a Christmas album that became a hit yeah. against yeah. everyone's belief. No one would thought we were crazy. Yeah. Everyone thought we were nuts when we did the Christmas record. And we made a really smart Christmas record and it became a hit. Yeah. Do you think the success had something to do with the, the inner fighting of the band? Yeah, jealousies over D. Yeah, because I mean, we, he I started to go off on his own a little bit, right? No, not in the band. He didn't, but mentally no. he did. Yeah, I mean, he's a narcissistic lead singer. You know, I mean, all the jokes about lead singers are true, which is what's the difference between a lead singer and a terrorist? And the answer is you can negotiate with the terrorist. You know, <laughs> amongst many jokes about lead singers, and D embodied many of those things. Um, and it took a lot of healing for us to come back from it. But I don't think Joe Perry would say anything different mm -hmm. uh, about Steven Tyler. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I, I know Eddie Van Halen wouldn't say anything different about David Lee Roth. I don't think um, Keith Richards would say anything different about Mick Jagger. I mean, if you read those books and those stories, mm -hmm. there's always these incredible clashes between the guitar players or the or band members and the singers. Because mm -hmm. the singers are put up front, like the glory position you know, the quarterback. Right. So it's, it's built, the, the cake is baked mm -hmm. already like that. Was Love is for Suckers, was that supposed to be a D solo album? Or is that just a rumor? No, it was, I think D wanted to make it a solo album and the record label pushed it to be a twisted record. Uh-huh. Now, were that, you for that or, or no? Well, at that point, I had checked out him mentally. Have you? I, okay. I knew it was over. We went through the motions to we went through the motions because of a because of the record contract. Yeah. Because we owed a lot of money to a merch company. So we went through the motions in order to see if we could recoup the money and it didn't recoup, which is why I had to file for bankruptcy and why D had to file for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Because we owed a lot of money to uh, a merch company that gave us a lot of money. We got the first million dollar advance, the first ever million dollar advance in the music industry for merchandise was given to Madonna, Twisted Sister, and Springsteen. Mm. Okay. Okay. And um, and we signed a personal services contract, and when we couldn't pay it back, we were forced to declare bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And you which guys in the book? It, what's that? It in the book. I go into yeah. Specific. And you called it quits before the whole scene took a change, too, right? You what? When did you guys leave? Eighty eight, eighty nine? No, yeah, eighty seven. Oh, seven. The end of eighty seven. Before grunge wiped out everything, like the dinosaurs, you know, the, the meteor came in and wiped out the dinosaurs. We were already gone. Yeah. But we didn't have to suffer the indignity of losing our job when Smells Like Teen Spirit came out, which yeah. destroyed everybody's yeah. life. I mean, destroyed Molly Crew, destroyed mm -hmm. White Snake, destroyed, it destroyed everything. It was like yeah. the fucking, it was, it was the asteroid that hit Mexico yeah. <laughs> and destroyed everything, right? So, so we never suffered the indignity of, of that 
And then when COVID hit this year, you know, in, two, in 2020, we already stopped in 2016. Meanwhile, everybody I knew who's still out there got destroyed. Yeah. Are you seeing I, the future? Do you know? Do you know what happens? <laughs> no idea. Uh, people always ask me about Twisted, and I say I have no idea. Yeah. I yeah. say never. I won't say never anymore, but I just I don't see it ever happening again. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't see a reason why we should. Yeah. Uh, I have no desire. I don't sit around and go, hey, man, I really need to play guitar. I really felt that way after the first breakup. There was stuff to do, but now I've done it all. Sure. I played the sure. biggest shows in the world, headlined the biggest shows in the world, blowing everybody off the stage. I care to blow off the stage. That I know we just fucking disassembled, disassembled this band or whatever, just fucking fucked up a festival. I did all that. The, 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 the music is licensed around the world. Yeah. It generates a lot of money. I don't worry about that. Our record royalties are great. I don't worry about that. Right. You know, I'm sitting back and enjoying it a little bit. Yeah, enjoy life. And so, you know, I I I, I wrote my book and I do motivational speaking. And you know, if you want to hire me, you can always hire me by contacting um ask jjts at gmail.com. That's ask jj that's j y j y t s at gmail.com. So I do corporate gigs all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love that. Yeah, I love talking to companies because did you do, did, go ahead, because we're a company, you know, and that's what we do. So did you do a book tour when your yeah, book came out? But modified because of COVID. So you, you can only do some stores because no stores wanted you. Barnes Noble wasn't booking anybody. Mm -hmm. So it really was a problem. So the question was, how long are you going to wait before the book comes out for who knew? Yeah. So I said, okay, let's just do it already. Yeah. Well, the first pressing sold out, I believe, right? Yeah. Second press is going to will sell out by the end of this year. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it'll, hard, it'll go to soft cover. Soft cover. Okay. So the book is available on Amazon, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it available anywhere else or, or pretty much Amazon? Mostly Amazon. Mostly Amazon because the bookstores don't carry very many books these days. They just don't. And there's no very few bookstores. So Amazon's the best way to get it. Isn't Amazon the best way to buy everything these days? I mean, pretty much. I mean, I pretty much get everything through Amazon. Yeah, you want the band? Go to Amazon. You can buy Twisted Sister. We'll come to your house. Yeah. Hey, you know what I wanted to ask you? Um, do you guys have like a double album or something coming out or it's already out? We, we have. We have a, a, a best of live in the studio and, and, and live out now, double vinyl, and we have the 40th anniversary of Under the Blade coming out okay. this year. It'll be called, I believe, Under and Before the Blade. So it'll have the original Secret Records Under the Blade album for the first time and not the Atlantic version, but the original Secret Records version, which is always the preferred version. And it will have um, all the demos and outtakes we did leading up to the record that were recorded through several studios around Long Island. Mm -hmm. proceeding so that's fine stuff out. yeah hey Final. you know in, in your book as well you uh talk a little bit about each album and was it under the blade that you recorded in the barn yeah what yeah. i wanted to ask you about that is you mentioned that you brought in a uh mobile recording studio what what was a mobile recording studio like back then um well the mickey most studio was famous you know mickey uh -huh. most was a producer and he he had Rolling Stones, every, everybody. And people didn't want to necessarily record in a the studio. They wanted to record in a home or a, or a live location. So we had a studio in a, in a van. And that was a mobile studio. So you didn't record in the van. It's just the mixing console was in the van. Okay. You understand the tape decks and the mixing mm -hmm. console, and the power generator was in the van and the compressors yeah. and everything else. But you ran mic lines to wherever you were running your mic lines to. You know, didn't matter if it was in a house didn't matter if it was on stage. That's what a mobile unit, a mobile recording unit was. Why did you do it in a barn? We had very little money. Okay. Like it was a small record deal. Mm -hmm. The label was able to work out the rental of the mobile unit. And the record label was able to get a guy who owned the barn in, the, in Hastings, England, and who would rent it probably for $100 a day, you know, because he's not using the barn. So we had hay bales in between the Marshall lambs. It's pretty funny. Sure. The photos sure. are in there. Um, that's why it was done for money. Because we had, we, I think we had $20,000 to make the record. Okay. Okay. Um, talk to me before we go about your podcast that you have. JJ's so French Connection, right? Yeah, JJ's 
beyond the music, I have authors, musicians, writers, doctors, because I've had a lot of procedures. So I've got I've had specialists on prostate cancer, heart disease, because I had atrial fibrillation. I had a doctor that deals with um, uveitis, which is an inflammatory eye disease that my daughter has. So I have doctors who dealt with that. I'd bring people on people who I like and are knowledgeable about, and I believe the world should know about. Okay. So actors and movies that I like, like I had Catherine Mary Stewart from Weekend at Bernie's on recently because of Bert, Weekend at Bernie's is one of my favorite silly movies. It's just on the top of my pile. Right. I watch right. Weekend at Bernie's to kill me. I mean, I love I love Citizen Kane, but I like Weekend at Bernie's, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I so I had her on. I had um, Barry Boswick from from uh, um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, we we twisted played the very first Rocky Horror Picture Show convention, nineteen seventy six. Oh. Long Island, and Barry wasn't even at that one, and he acknowledged it. We were there; he was not, but Tim Curry was, and that was. You, cool. you guys probably fit in well there. Oh, it was perfect because <laughs> yeah. because the image of Tim Curry is what propelled Twisted for a couple of years. You know, okay. when he joined the band, at just at that point, Rocky Hard came out, and so yeah. we were able to jump on that bandwagon. So I have people like that. I have actors. I've got great musicians. I've had, I, I'm booked, I booked Keb Moe because I happen to be a huge Keb Moe fan. Keb Moe's going to do it. But I, I've had um, the guys from Def Leppard, the guys from uh, Leonard Skinner. I've had D. I've had Rob Halford. I've had Elliot Easton from The Cars. You know, a lot of bands that I know, musicians who I love, that I care about. Uh, great guitar players like Joe Bonamassa. Oz Noy, who's probably the number one jazz fusion guitar player in the world, who lives near me in New York, he's been on, Joe Bonamassa has been on, um, movie directors, uh, authors, writers, you know, just like a good mix of people. It's not just, that's why it's called Beyond the Music. It's that's why it's called JJ French Connection Beyond the Music. It's not just the music. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. So I, I, I love the podcast. It's on Spotify, Apple, and podcast one it's called the jj french connection jay jay french and that french connection is the take off the movie french connection obviously so the podcast is happening the book obviously twisted business is is that and then twisted still does what twisted does which is we release product and next year's our 50th anniversary and we're trying to figure out what to do i think you should make exactly. some funko pops oh that's coming well we've it's got like yeah yeah I think i've got like gonna... 200 of those things i love those things yeah yeah I gotta, I'll get the twisted one. As soon as they come yeah, out, I think they're doing a D one. Are now. they doing one of you or no? Uh, they just did. We had um, we had these action figures just made, but I I just got a thing on D uh, artwork on D for him, and uh, th- it looks like that's coming out. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, cool. All right, JJ. Listen, man, I could talk to you all night. I don't want to keep you too long, though. I mean, I've got so much i could just keep talking to you You got some great stories i'm sure well i didn't want to be a boring guest so thanks for having me on yeah I man it. i i appreciate it got some good stories for me though one very rarely told ones which is good cool you know okay well good really which well, is, which is i really enjoyed it i gotta say i really enjoyed it thank you